uh, his talk is titled Bayesian Networks, a Bayesian-like connections model displaying flexible learning and network by bursting. Uh, bursting. Um, so Savi is a co-founder and chief scientist at Optimizing Mind. Um, and his most relevant paper about the subject discusses a symbolic neural network that uses self-inhibitory self feed-forward feedback connections to enable recall in addition to recognition. So I'll hand it over to Savi. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, introduction uh, of your screen. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so thank you. Uh, so the predominant uh, recognition and learning models of the brain are either Bayesian network which are actually the most brain-like because they have a logic type of reasoning through uh, priming or preferences determined by priors or, and also likelihoods, um, which is like the expectation of what the network is looking for. But the problem with this type of model is it's not connectionist. You must calculate distributions. And what happens is you cannot really build this model with theoretical neurons and it's not scalable to large uh, networks. And the other models are neural networks uh, or feed forward type neural networks where basically you're solving the recognition problem by taking the input and multiplying it by the weights. And this is actually much more scalable but there's no brain like priming or expectation and it and although it's considered connectionist, it's only semi-connectionist because you can only model recognition through theoretical um, neurons, not necessarily learning. Because in order to do learning, you would have to deal with this gambling problem, which is tend to be ignored, where you have to store all the examples, shuffle them, and present them one at a time. And neuroscientists tend not to do this. And I, I'll jump into a, a little bit more detail about what I mean by this um, gambling problem. So when you're looking at an environment, you might see something, like, let's say a bicycle, and you'll learn it, a car, you'll learn it, and another type of bicycle, you, you just learn it. And you learn the patterns just as they come by in life. And it's unsorted and it can come randomly. There's no rhyme or, or reason. But this is not true of the feed-forward models. Um, they require carefully dealing the training data. And so a corresponding neural network timeline to learn the same thing, uh, for the first pattern, you can just learn it. But if you see it with the second pattern, well, what you have to do is shuffle it, which is like dealing, like a car dealer, and then reshuffle it, present it to the, the network, reshuffle, present to the network until the network learns. And then you go through this process and you repeat. Now, the next pattern you want to learn, you have to start from the beginning, redeal, reshuffle, repeat, and so on and so forth. So all of this is not easy to implement with neurons because neurons would have to learn each one of these patterns, store them, and then have a mechanism to pull them out and rehearse. And moreover, in a feed-forward network, the data must be carefully prepared and balanced. And what's even worse, as a neuroscientist, this is not implemented usually in neurons. So we see the models and we see the outcome and we see the model during recognition, which looks very connectionist, but the learning is not connection just by having to encode this sort of rehearsal. So I call this the gambling problem. And if, if you get anything from this talk, uh, this is it. Um, and on top of everything, neither of those two models display network-wide bursting. And what that is, if, is if you record neurons, and you, especially in a, in a sensory system, and then you present uh, some sort of a stimulus, then you'll see an increase of activation of a lot of neurons, and then they come back down and decrease. And you see this ubiquitously in, every, in many organisms and so on. Uh, but this is not inherent in these networks. You can model them, but then you'd have to put in um, uh, integrators and things like that. It's, it's basically not innate in the models. 
So I introduced uh, this Brazian model, which uses presynaptic regular regulatory feedback, and it's presynaptic. The output goes back to the input and inhibits it. Um, and in this, the weights become the likelihood average. The priors are, are determined by the activation of, of the neurons and so on. So I'm low on time, so I will kind of walk you through how this works. Basically, each input that projects to output neurons, well, those output neurons have to project back to those input neurons and inhibit them. That's part of this uh, regulatory, uh, inhibitory, homeostatic type of feedback. And that's, that holds true in any input. So any other input that projects to outputs, well, they would have to feed back and then inhibit back into the neuron. And that's how the, this network is, is built. And you can intermesh these as much as you want. You just got to follow the, those rules where inhibition has to go back to the same inputs that it came from. And then you can draw this whole system much simpler. Instead of this, you can just draw them as, as feed forward feedback uh, connections uh, to, back to the inputs. So how does this whole system work? What I will do is I'm going to compare uh, feed forward and and the system. And so here I'm drawing just simple matrices with two inputs and two outputs. So there's gonna be two output nodes, two input nodes. First, I will just show feed forward. Uh, so before I do that, I, I wanna learn, let's say that neuron YA is going to be active when X1 is one. Um, and neuron YB is gonna be active uh, when, when X1 and X2 are one. Um, and so these are actually the likelihood patterns. So in, a, in the Brazian network, what you can do is just basically put that into the weights. Um, basically, this is your expectation. So you just put that into weights and that's all that the model needs to learn. It then estimates the distribution. Um, so the learning is simple. Now, if you wanted to do the same thing with feed forward networks, you would have to iterate through these type of examples until you got the feed forward weights, which are these. And now you would uh, uh, run, run that. Uh, so let's draw first for the example for the feed forward. Well, feed forward is just feed forward weights. So you put them here and then you can put in a test of one of these patterns uh, and you can look at the that plot of the dynamics uh, and I'm not going to draw ones and zeros. I'll just do yellow for active, black inactive, and any sort of gray in the middle is some sort of value. I present this test as a stimulus. I do my y equal wx, and I, I get the right answer uh, here. But this is the, the dynamics. They're, they're not really dynamics. It's just you multiply it through. And then you put the other input you expect, and you get uh, the same uh, thing. Now let's do the Brazian networks. Um, you have the, the same outputs and the same inputs, but now you have this intermediate uh, inhibition, which roughly is like an error. And so now let's draw the weights. So the weights are these uh, likelihoods. So the only key here, I'm not gonna draw zero when it's zero, uh, but if there's a weight going from input to output, there has to be a weight going from output to input and inhibiting back the same input. If there's two going up, there has to be two coming down and that's it, that, that's, that's your network. Now it's iterative during recognition and this is a little counterintuitive. So we're doing the iterations during recognition to find the activations, not to learn the weights. The weights are the likelihood. So information goes up, uh, forward, then down, back, forward, back, forward. And this is the dynamics that you get out of this network. So if you put in uh, the, the test stimulus and it remains constant, initially both the inputs come up and this is not what's uh, expected. So then both outputs become active and this in a sense causes a burst. Then information goes back down, starts inhibiting the, new, the inputs. Now this input has twice as much inhibition than, than this one, so it gets dialed down and this is how the, the neurons become separated. So that input gets 
inhibited. But now when in the feed forward pass, um, this neuron is more affected by this input than this neuron. So they start separating in activation. And so then the dynamics start separating out. And this process continues iteratively. And the dynamics continue separating out, separating out until you get uh, the, the same outputs that you would have gotten with the feed forward networks, but you used the likelihood and you didn't have to go through any of this uh, rehearsal during learning and learning becomes much simpler. Uh, and I'm going to show you a demonstration of that. What I'm gonna do is take the iris data set because it's super simple. There are four types of inputs and three types of outputs, uh, petals of a flower. Um, so what I do is I train on data from only two of the flowers. I just designate two nodes, take all the data for those two flowers, and I train them, and, I, and then I test the network, and I get, um, and it's accurate. Then I designate a new node for flower three, and then I train only on flower three, no rehearsal whatsoever of anything that's been previously learned. And then I can test the whole network. And it's exactly the same as if I had randomized the, the, the inputs, presented all the, the flowers, rehearsed or not rehearsed. So this system allows much more flexible learning without that uh, pesky rehearsal. And so this network shows this um, network right bursting. Here's another example. I trained a network on MNIST. And here I put in um, the dynamics uh, of recognizing, I put in the, the digit one, and I look at the dynamics of the circuit when it's going to recognize digit one. And you see most of the digits burst for a little bit and then they come back down, but then only the one that uh, remains active uh, is the one that, that, that end, ends up with the output. So, in a big picture, um, in the brain, well, you don't know what, what's the mechanism of recognition, but it's connectionist, it's got priors, likelihoods, don't know what it's doing with the distributions, but it's pretty easy to learn and learn in a modular way where you can add a new, uh, add a new idea at any point without having to rehearse old one. And it shows the network wide bursting uh, inherently. Now the Bayesian network, so what I've compared is the Bayesian network, the feed forward network and the Bayesian network. Now the Bayesian is not connectionist um, and the neural network is half connectionist because you can't really uh, build it up uh, with neurons for the rehearsal very easily. Uh, and the Bayesian doesn't need that rehearsal. So it's more, um, uh, it, it's more connectionist. Um, the Bayesian allows you priors, the neural network, the priors are, in, are embedded within the rehearsal of the training. So you don't really have access to them. They're there, but, but you don't have access. And the Bayesian network, you can slightly modify the activation of the neurons and that's like um, putting a prior. And then likelihoods, um, Bayesian networks have them, neural networks don't, um, and, but the Bayesian does. And the way distributions are taken care of in the Bayesian network, you have to explicitly calculate them. In the neural network, they're set by the rehearsal. And in the Bayesian network, the distributions are estimated during recognition when you have the pattern that you wanna recognize and you have the knowledge of all the other patterns that you've learned before, then it takes those with the feed forward feedback estimates which ones should have the priority, which ones match the best. Um, so it's not, it's neither explicitly calculated nor is it uh, put into the training set. And so I've shown that it's easier to update. Uh, you don't have the, the scaling issues or, or the rehearsal. And um, you see this network wide bursting. Oh, well, I'm on time. Uh, any questions? Thank you, Sri. That was great. Uh, I feel like, I mean, as I was going through your paper, I didn't quite get a handle on how operation networks were a step 
better than people would our feedback networks by themselves, but I think I get a really good idea. There are no questions from the attendees yet, but I did want to ask a specific question. In the network, how dense do the inhibitory connections uh, need to be? Like, do, are they fully interconnected? Do they need to be? Um, no, they're as dense as the feed forward connection because there's always symmetry. So if you've got, you know, a, a, a big tree going out, it has to come, come back in. Uh, I've done uh, tests on scalability where I've basically made, you know, huge flat networks more than you would in the feed forward network. And it actually is able to deal with the, these huge networks better because it doesn't need those rehearsal um, processes. So more inputs don't kind of inhibit the, all the adjusting of the, and sending back the error signal and so on. And the, the other question I wanted to ask is, there are uh, networks of the brain that are also uh, hypothesized to con consist of mostly inhibitory synapses, inhibitory mm -hmm. recurrent synapses. Uh, and so have you, do you have any idea or are you planning to extend this to uh, testing on uh, actual neural networks? Well, so my theory is that, so, so in this network, there's as many inhibitory connections as excitatory connections, right? It, it, it has to be. So I think that's already more realistic in some sense Absolutely. than the uh, uh, networks. And, and they're also top-down feedback. They're not lateral inhibition. They're not you know, what you call recurrent in, a, in time, it's actually back to the same inputs, which is what you see in the, in the brain. So, and you can't do um, kind of the feed forward learning on that back prop won't work when you're inhibiting back to your own uh, input, right? And so this is completely, completely you know, different. You're saying that it's already a lot closer to what the brain actually does rather than what an artificial neural network. Yeah, so the fact that you see this bursting, for example, uh, where the network, when it's not expecting a signal and it gets something that it's not expecting, it kind of jumps up and back down. You don't see that in the, in the feed forward uh, network. And I, I also thought this talk will be um, shorter. You also see some um, other phenomena which are more cognitive-like, which speaks more to the brain, uh, like difficulty with similarity. So if you're trying to do a search between two very similar things, it's harder than if they're separate. And you see this in this network because if, they're, if things are similar, the inhibition goes to the same place. And so it's harder to, to gather the activation. While if they're different, uh, if, uh, if they're more orth orthogonal, then uh, they're more independent and faster and so on. Uh, we have one question from the audience. Um, I was wondering how scalable is it in direction for a more complex cognitive task? This is from Kirabel Danieli. Sure. Um, well, I can, let's see if I've got the slides for, for my, uh, oh no, I don't, of course I don't. Um, let me open up. Uh, Just give me a sec. Uh, so I will show you uh, my scalability uh, 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 tests. Um, I believe it's this one. Let's see. Hopefully, I got all of that. You cannot find it if you can just mention it. That should be okay. Uh, to the audience, we are playing a little fast and loose with time because we don't have seem to have the speak the third speaker. That's why. Yeah. All right. So, so here I've done, um, basically I, I've taken uh, a, just a crappy computer um, and what I've done is I've generated random data and I increased the number of nodes and the number of input features. So this is the number of inputs, right? And so all I'm trying to do is see how scalable it is. Um, and so, you know, the matrix size is just multiply the number of nodes by the number of inputs. And I, I, used, I did this a while ago, but I, I was trying to emulate like what you can do on a cell phone, let's say. Um, and so I, I compared support vector machines 
um, where I ran out of memory as soon as I got like a thousand inputs and, and 500 outputs. Um, while um, the fastest way I, I could figure out how to do a feed forward learning, I ran out of memory at about uh, 10,000 inputs with uh, 2,000 outputs. Um, but when I did it with this, I could go all the way up to 120 um, before, um, before it stopped. Um, and, and so that, those are, that's during learning. So I could, I could do all, all the way up to 120. I couldn't do more than that because the random generator caused the running out of air, uh, memory error. Um, and then I compared during recognition because during recognition, this method has to go back and forth and iterate. So I wanted to give an indication of how fast is this uh, iteration. So here you have the computational cost per test for the feed forward networks. Oh, I'm um, sorry, we're not, I don't think we're seeing your screen. Oh no. So, all the time, <laughs> oh, sh poop. Okay, sorry about that. I didn't realize you were showing something. Oh, yeah, I was. <laughs> I have all this. The, uh, all right, here, let, let me share my screen. Sorry about that. Uh, how do I share it? Okay, uh, share my screen again. So this is what I was showing. Um, thank you for letting me know. Basically, I've set up a chart of the number of outputs and the number of inputs. And I, I just increased those um, uh, as I go along. And the matrix size is just kind of multiplying these two together. And I want to see how scalable this is during learning. Uh, and I used a pretty crappy computer. Um, but the point was to see, say, in a cell phone, how much you can do. Um, and I did support vector machines and it ran out of memory out of, at, um, this is computing time. Uh, mm -hmm. It ran out of, and it ran out of memory, uh, you know, before I got to 500 uh, on here, uh, 500,000. Then um, I, I did the fastest feed, fastest feed forward uh, learning I could and it ran out of memory at 20 million here. Um, and then I did, uh, the Brazian network until 120,000. Beyond that, the um, uh, the random number generator ran out of. Uh, um, and then I compared with the computational costs when you're testing it. And so feed forward networks are they're really quick because you're just doing one, one multiplication, but they ran out of memory at, at uh, 20, uh, 20 million. Uh, here. Um, so this is really fast, but uh, it ran out of memory. With the Brazian network, um, it just continued to increase linearly uh, in the, the amount of time it took with relative to the size all the way to uh, 120 uh, to, you know, here was about uh, two seconds per test, right? So so that, that's the measure, that, that's to answer the question about scalability. Um, Fascinating. And then I tried to also compare this against k-nearest neighbors, and k-nearest neighbors take longer than the iterations that, that you do with uh, the, 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 the Brazian network. I, I think I overkill answered that question. But- uh, well, we, had, we, we had a little bit of time. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask, the attendees, if you have any questions for either of our speakers at this point, um, going once, going twice. All right. If not, I wanted to thank Suvi for a wonderful talk and thank, thank you, you for staying over and answering more questions and and.